Okay, so chapter six, and we've covered a lot of chapter six um, in lab. So let's start off of what it's about. It's about the integument. What's the integument? That's our skin. Fun fact, the integument is the largest organ in the body. And just for your um, information, we are now going from this point on, talk about organ systems of your body. So why not start with the largest organ system and let's talk about the skin. So you see that the skin makes up almost 10%, anywhere between seven to 8% of your body weight. It ranges in thickness, okay? So again, a lot of this, it's really tough to kind of figure that out um, when you're uh, trying to think about how thick the skin is. Anywhere between um, 1.5 millimeters is about the thickness of a pencil tip to about four millimeters. So again, that's almost half of the centimeter. That's maybe about the quarter of the width of your pinky tip there. So you can see it changes quite a bit. All right, but one of the big things when we talk about the skin is the fact that it offers protection. It's a protective barrier, literally a physical barrier that's going to keep the external environment separate from our internal environment. So it keeps us safe from physical harm, okay? trauma, right, if you get hit by something, right, keeps out tons of pathogens like viruses, bacteria, parasites, certain chemicals, if it were to get onto the skin, right, with that it won't bother the skin as much as let's say if it got onto say the skeletal muscle or any of the internal organs there. Another big role as we progress through this chapter, and I've talked about it many times, keeps us safe from solar radiation, ultraviolet radiation that comes from the sun. And so we see how we get protected by that um, later on in the chapter. Another function of the skin, I feel like I missed, oh, dirt, I missed this slide. We'll come back to the functions here in a second, okay? So when we talk about the skin, okay, or the integumentary system, Yes, we're gonna talk about the skin and all the components, and then also what we call the accessory uh, tissues. Right, and that includes our nails, hair, our glands, right? So when we are talking about chapter five, the four different types of membranes, our second type of membrane that we were talking about is the cutaneous membrane. And that's a commonly used term, so I really urge you to know this. In fact, it's been asked on test questions too. And we'll use the skin all the time to tell the health of somebody. We've talked about how if they're jaundice, right? Or if you can see a lot of redness under the skin, right? So I do it all the time when I come out to greet patients in the waiting room. I'm doing a actual, I joke around and I call it an ocular pat down. So I'm assessing what this person looks like and what they're doing. For example, if they get up out of the chair and they have a hard time getting up out of the chair, that tells me something. But the first thing I do is I look them over, not obvious, but I look them over as I'm reading them and I'm assessing some of their health because the skin will tell you what's going on. All right, so back to our functions. Another function for the skin, and I, I want you to kind of, Keep an open mind here when we're going through these functions. A lot of these functions should look familiar to you because these same functions or a lot of these functions were the same functions for epithelial tissue. All right, so go, we already know some of the functions of epithelial tissue, so that will help us when we're trying to remember the functions of the integument. All right, so another function for the integument is all right, prevention of water loss. Think of your skin, all right, we said it's a physical barrier. And yes, it's a physical barrier that prevents water from leaving your body, okay? And any water that does leave, so, leave your body does so by design. So most of that water that leaves your body is going to be through sweat glands, all right? And through the process, and it also involves the sweat glands, all right, so you have, uh, like when you're starting to sweat, and that water gets 
secreted onto the surface of your skin through your sweat glands, it'll evaporate off and it gives you that cooling effect. Well, from time to time, your sweat glands will release water vapor, right? During the process of what we call transpiration. And that's not an active sweat process. It's just a little bit of puff of water vapor will leave. So I've said it before, your, your, your skin is not waterproof as evidence of wrinkling of the skin when you've been in the water too much, but it is water resistant, which is important because it also helps to prevent dehydration. And dehydration can be a very bad thing, especially when you get burnt. Two things that uh, the medical staff are concerned about for folks that have significant burns on their body. One is dehydration. The other thing that they're worried about is infection. All right, the third function, vitamin D or metabolic regulation. And then we're gonna talk about the metabolic regulation of vitamin D. All right, vitamin D, the active form is called calcitriol. And you should know that, okay? That is the active form of vitamin D. So here's what happens. Your keratinocytes are going to create, all right, the um, cholecalciparol when exposed to ultraviolet radiation. So you go out into the sun, the ultraviolet radiation strikes your keratinocytes and it starts to make cholecalciparol. Cholecalciparol then is going to enter your bloodstream from your skin and it's going to travel to the liver. Once it gets to the liver, it gets converted into calcidiol which is an intermediate, all right, for our vitamin D. And then it'll go back into the blood and circulate around until it winds up in the kidney. And here's where it gets converted into calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D. The hallowed substance that your body really, really enjoys when we're talking about metabolic regulation, there's many, many functions for uh, vitamin D. Um, I'm not gonna get into that right now, okay? But we're gonna talk about calcitriol's function in the fact that it helps to increase absorption of calcium and phosphate in your small intestine. So when your blood calcium levels are low, all right, this hormone, Right, calcitriol is going to stimulate an increase in absorption of calcium and phosphate from the small intestine and return it into your bloodstream, which is good because once that calcium enters in the bloodstream, it'll help to increase your, cal your blood calcium levels. So keep in mind, calcitriol is made in the kidney and it, but its function is to increase the absorption of calcium and phosphate in the small intestine. Um, we'll also see how uh, with metabolic regulation, for example, melanocytes and their production of melanin, okay? Because of that ultraviolet radiation striking the melanocytes, they'll increase production of melanin and share it with the cells in their surrounding areas to help coat the nucleus to protect the DNA. So there's other uh, um, metabolic uh, reactions that occur, um, but I'm not gonna go through all those. But the vitamin D one is gonna be the most important because we're gonna revisit that a little bit when we get into uh, chapter seven, the next chapter when we're talking about um, blood calcium levels. All right, here we go. Another, another function similar to epithelial uh, tissue is secretion and absorption. All right, so as you know, you have glands in your skin and those glands are going to secrete stuff onto the surface of the skin. S depending on the gland will determine what kind of stuff they're secreting onto the surface of your skin. All right, most of our glands are gonna be secreting out these folks right here, urea, salts, and water. Quite a bit of water, in fact. 
Um, some glands, like our sebaceous glands, are going to sec secrete that oil oily sebum, which is bacterial cytal. Okay, helps to nourish and protect uh, the hair and some of the skin there. Okay, our apocrine glands, similar, they also produce their secretions under the hair too. All right, but secretion plays a big role in our electrolyte homeostasis. And what that means is electrolytes are certain types of molecules, right, that can actually conduct electricity, but we don't really care about that part of the definition. We're more concerned of like, what are electrolytes? You've seen Gatorade commercials and you'll see in the commercial, someone will be sweating profusely. They'll drink some Gatorade and then there'll be a caption at the bottom of the screen. It says restores fluids and electrolytes. Well, electrolytes are gonna be these molecules, right? That are gonna help with certain metabolic functions of the body, sodium and potassium. I know you don't know this now, but that, that, that's crucial in proper neurological function for the functioning of your neurons, right? Magnesium plays a huge role, right? Magnesium is involved in over 600 different reactions in your body. Think about that for a second, 600. It plays a huge role in the production of ATP, okay? So we don't talk about that too much, but it's crucial to know that. So all right, our, our, um, our glands, our skin is going to help with the proper balancing of the electrolytes in your body. All right, absorption. Talked about this before, okay? How certain chemicals and drugs can be uh, absorbed through the skin while blocking others, All right? So therefore our skin is selectively permeable. And so we'll use certain types of drugs and a method of administering those drugs are gonna be what we call transdermal administration or AKA the patch, All right? We can put a patch with some drugs on it onto the surface of your skin. And those drugs, right, will be absorbed through the skin and to the underlying blood vessels found in the dermis there. The nice thing about this uh, method of administering the drugs is it's slow and it lasts for a long period of time. In certain cases, if you don't wanna overwhelm the patients with too much drugs, you use this method. Immune function, we talked about immune function before with our dendritic cells. All right, those are the cells that were found in the stratum spinosum and the stratum granulosum in our epidermis. All right, and these are the cells that if they come in contact with abnormal cell growth or some sort of, some sort of pathogen, like a virus or a bacteria, it'll initiate an immune response. And so it will help with the destruction of these infectious agents. So... Big, big time, and I know I mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating, right? It's these cells that are the early warning detection system for cancer, Because right? like I said, some of you might even have cancerous cells in your skin right now as we're speaking, but it's these dendritic cells that monitor that come across these cancer cells or when they're uh, precancerous, okay? When they're metaplastic and bam, they get destroyed. Temperature regulation, okay? Again, because of the blood vessels that are present in your skin and the sweat glands here, we see how that works. What happens when you're hot? You start to sweat, you perspire, the water evaporates off your body, giving you a cooling effect. The blood, all right, that is in your body will travel to the capillaries and blood vessels in your skin closer to the surface of the skin so they can release heat to cool you down. Those blood vessels can um, be manipulated through, with the smooth muscle that are in the blood vessels. And, it can, and um, what will happen is if we want to control how much blood comes to the skin and how little, right? What we can do is change the diameter of those blood vessels. For example, we have vasodilation. Vasodilation increases blood flow to the skin. Therefore, we can release the heat. So that's what occurs when you get warm. 
the um, vasoconstriction will shunt the blood away from the skin and keep it more towards the internal uh, portion of your body around your abdomen and your internal organs. And we see that when you get cold. And then finally, we got our sensory reception. Remember what I said before? I know I've mentioned this before. A lot of sensory receptors are found in your skin. So it's this input that goes to your central nervous system, your control center, to help us, all right, to get constant feedback of the external environment. And even in some cases, the internal environment. So you can see, we have thermal receptors there for heat and cold. We've got tactile receptors for touch, pressure, vibration. We have pain receptors there, okay? So we have quite a bit. And so it's crucial that we have a decent understanding of all that. All right, let's talk about a quick review here, the layers of the integument, okay? A couple of important facts here. When we're talking about the epidermis, it is made up of epithelium, specifically stratified squamous epithelium. In the dermis, all right, the deeper layer there, all right, that's the layer that has all the stuff. Primarily, the majority of it is going to be, when we're talking about tissue content, it's going to be dense, irregular connective tissue. All right, we have all the other tissue types there too, all right, but primarily the dermis is going to be made up of dense, irregular connective tissue, which is good because that's going to give our skin both its resiliency because of all the collagen fibers there, and it'll give it its flexibility or, its, or what we would call pliability because of all the elastic fibers there too. Then we've got a layer of tissue below the skin, the integument, the dermis there. That's the subcutaneous layer or the hypodermis. Okay, important fact, you may be asked this, not a part of the integumentary system. All right, it is made up of adipose and areolar connective tissue. I don't know why this is here. I don't like that. Give me one second. We'll make that disappear. There we go. Who says I can't edit on the fly? Okay. All right, so we've all seen this picture before. It's just giving us a small sampling of the skin and showing us everything that's in there, all the different tissue types, all the different structures, okay? So we're gonna now go through the epidermis here and the dermis, all right, today and just do a generalized review, okay? So you can test your knowledge on here. All right, the epidermis predominantly is made up of stratified squamous epithelium. And the predominant cell type are gonna be the keratinocytes. So a lot of that epithelium will be keratinized. There are four to five layers uh, of the epidermis, depending on where you are. The first layer is the deepest layer, stratum basal, B, basal, bottom, okay? Then we have stratum spinosum, granulosum, stratum lucidum, thick skin only, and then our stratum corneum. So it's in this layer here in which our cells start to kill themselves. That's where that keratinization process occurs. So that's why we say first, second, and third layers contain living keratinocytes. They haven't quite killed themselves off yet. All right, so let's start off with the first layer, right? This has been asked on test questions before. Another name for the stratum basal, stratum germinativum. All right, this is the deepest layer. It's one cell layer thick. And as we know, Right. This should be easy to remember, all epithelium, right? There are exceptions to the rule, mind you, but all epithelium sits on top of the basement membrane. And in this layer, we have three cell types, the keratinocytes, the melanocytes, and the tactile cells. All right, so we're going to go through each of those individually. 
So let's start off with the keratinocytes. All right, this cell is gonna be found in all the layers, right? In the strata cell, it starts off as a stem cell. And we talked about what happens with stem cells last class. You'll have a stem cell, it's an undifferentiated cell. It will divide and then it will produce two daughter cells. One daughter cell will, cell will remain to divide again at a later time. The other one migrates into the next superficial layer and then it'll start to undergo some changes there. Okay, but it's these cells that make the keratin and the keratin has one job, strengthen the epidermis, make it strong. All right, the second cell type in this layer are the melanocytes. These are the ones that are going to make and store the melanin. Right? And it's that melanin that's going to protect the DNA that's found in the nucleus when it's exposed to ultraviolet radiation. So it makes it, stores it, and then what will happen is it will then transfer the melanin via the melanosomes to other cells in the area. It's the sharing carrying cell, the melanocytes there. And, the, and that melanin gives us right, the pigmentation to our skin. Keep in mind, everybody's roughly got the same number of melanocytes in their bodies, right? But some are just more active than others. Okay, the third cell uh, that sits in the stratum basal. Tactile cells, also known as Merkel cells, these are going to be right, the cells that are going to influence the sensory nervous system. So they're touch sensitive. So when these cells become compressed, they release a chemical, it's a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter is a chemical that will stimulate right, uh, other neurons or end organs like a nerve, uh, excuse me, like a muscle or a gland. So they release the chemicals, these cells will, and that will stimulate these sensory nerve endings that are close by, and then I'll transmit sensory information to the central nervous system, all right, relating to touch. All right, so that's the first layer, the stratum of cell, first layer, done. Now, we'll move on to the second layer, and as we're doing that, we're moving superficially closer to the surface of the skin. So this layer, <clears throat> the stratum spinosum, this layer just received its fresh, brand new daughter keratinocyte. And so what will happen in this layer is the cell will start to form these relationships right, these adhesions with the neighboring keratinocytes, because soon these cells are gonna to start to produce the keratin. But right now, the cells are going to start to tightly pack themselves against one another, form these intercellular junctions, right, to help make the epidermis stronger. And then when they start to produce the keratin, they're going to make the epidermis even stronger. In this layer, we're also going to find our immune cells, the Langerhans cells, our dendritic cells. And so they're, again, like I said before, they're going to attack cancerous cells. And if they come across any pathogens, they can initiate the immune response. And so if they do come across a pathogen, they'll gobble it up like Pac-Man. All right, our third layer, the stratum granulosum. Not a very thick layer, only about three to five cell layers thick, but it's important that you know that this is where we start and begin. It's the beginning of the end, they say. This is where we begin our keratinization, the killing of the cell. And these cells start to fill up with keratin, and as they do, it destroys the organelles and the nucleus, and when that occurs, the cell is dead. The fourth layer, which is only found in blank skin, in thick skin, okay, and there's only two places, 
And some of you may have gotten a test question on that on the lab. So I'm glad that I said that like 30 times, okay? So you're going to find, and I'm sure some of you um, were like, ah, oh, I remember Dr. Kaz saying that to me 10 times. Only two places, palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. This layer also does help assist right, in protection from ultraviolet radiation. All right, and finally, the last layer, the outermost layer, the stratum corneum. Okay, this is going to be the thickest layer, all right, anywhere between 20 to 30 cell layers thick. This is where we find our keratinized cells, which means they're all dead. They're all intertwined locked together, creating an awesome barrier to keep stuff out and to keep stuff in. And so when we look at this layer, and in fact, you look at it all the time when you're looking at yourself in the mirror, okay, when you're looking at other people, all right, this layer, the outside, right, is going to be dry, which is awesome because that makes it an unsuitable environment for a lot of microorganisms, fungus loves moist, damp areas. Well, stratum corneum is not that. So if you're getting a fungal infection, something's up, okay? Because it's already an inhospitable, all right, environment for certain fungi, okay? But this thick and dry surface allows for the protective function, all right, of our, um, epidermis because one, it prevents uh, pathogens from getting in because, for infection. And if you happen to brush by something, all right, like, uh, I don't know, a piece of wood that has some rough edges on it, because it's thickened, it won't rip you right open. So because all the cells are dead, all right, we will not see any nuclei present there. So it takes about two weeks for the cells to get into this layer. When they make it into that layer, they're going to hang out there for about another two weeks. So your skin is constantly rolling over, all right, every month. Every month. And it varies because some areas of your skin are going to turn over quicker because some is thin, some is thick. Depends on what type of stresses are going on, okay? So I don't want you to think you're like a snake that every month you have a brand new, uh, you know, skin suit on. It doesn't work like that. Okay, so here you can see, all right, our micrograph here and then our drawing of all the different layers. So you can see how thick, how much stratum corneum is present here in this skin. So this is most likely going to be, all right, a thicker area here. Again, I can't tell if that's thick or thin skin because I can't see if there's nuclei present. All right. All right. I know I talked this, about this a little bit in lab, but I might as well kind of review it here now and talk about some of the variations that we're going to see in the epidermis before I move on to the dermis. Right. So the variations that we're going to talk about are going to include the thickness, color, and skin markings. So thick skin and thin skin. We know where thick skin is found, okay? Palms of your hands, soles of your feet. It will contain all five layers of the epidermal strata. And yes, we'll have sweat glands, but again, we know a little bit more now in this chapter about the other types of glands. And we know that sebaceous glands and apocrine glands are going to be found around hair follicles because they both secrete their secretions onto the hair follicle. So if there's no hair or hair follicle, you're not gonna have apocrine or uh, sebaceous glands. So that's what we're going to see here. No sebaceous glands because no hair follicles in thick skin. But in thin skin, 
we have sweat glands, we have hair follicles, so therefore we have sebaceous glands. Thin skin is found all over the place, but we don't have the stratum lucidum. Say goodbye. That's only in thick skin. All right, here's a nice picture depicting the difference between thin and thick skin. All right, the second type of variation is skin color. So we're gonna talk about these three items that play a role in skin color. Hemoglobin, the oxygen carrying protein that we find in our blood. Melanin, we've already discussed that briefly, and keratin. If you like carrots, you'll like keratin. All right, so it's the hemoglobin when oxidated, when there's oxygen bound to the hemoglobin that gives our blood its red coloration. So folks that are fair skinned, you'll be able to see, all right, especially if there's an increased blood flow to certain areas, right, you'll be able to see that red tint in their skin a little bit easier than folks that have a darker skin complexion. All right, we've already talked about melanin. So keep in mind, right, melanin is going to be produced all right, um, let me backtrack that. Melanin, all right, is produced by the melanocytes. It's stimulated to be produced by ultraviolet radiation, but you'll notice that some folks have darker color skin than others. And again, a lot of that is not just the ultraviolet radiation, but also our genes, our genetics, hereditary, okay, meaning mom and dad. Okay. If you don't have the gene somewhere, well, I'm gonna, I don't want to get into genetics right now. I was going to throw out some hair color uh, stuff, but let's not get into that. All right. Albino. Yeah, yes. I got a question. So melanin is the pigment and melanin is created for correct. Yes. Melanin is the name of the pigment. The melanocytes make it. And one of the things that stimulate the melanocytes to make the melanin is going to be ultraviolet radiation, sunlight. But also, your genes play a role in that too. They'll stimulate the production of melanin also. Okay, so that's why with some folks, all right, that have albinoism, right, their melanocytes don't make melanin. And we're going to talk about that in a moment here um, when we're talking about hair color. Probably not today, okay, because it's melanin that gives your hair its color. So someone that it's a true albino, right, will have white hair because there's no melanin in the hair. And then finally, we have carotene. Okay. When you take it in, it gets converted into vitamin A, which is very, very helpful. Trust me. Okay, because vitamin A is used for vision, all right, and it helps. This is huge, and we don't talk about it enough, and I won't talk about it too much now, but it helps to reduce these structures called free radicals. I don't think I've ever talked to you folks about free radicals. And so here's the best way that I can describe a free radical to you, all right? I'm hoping that you all know what a yo-yo is, okay? It's a hard plastic a uh, toy that's attached to a, a string. So here's what a free radical is. It's a molecule that has one single electron in its valence shell. And so imagine a little boy or girl, you know, I'm not gonna be biased, okay? A boy or a girl that goes into, all right, a, uh, um, a glass shop. They have glass plates, nice, beautiful uh, crystal glasses. And they take their, and they have a yo-yo and they swing that yo-yo around above their head. And they just start running into things with that yo-yo and smashing stuff. That's what a free radical does to your body, okay? It wanders around swinging that, uh, that electron and it just rips through stuff. And that's what they do. But Vitamin A helps to reduce free radicals. Vitamin C helps to reduce free radicals. So there's my explanation for free radicals. All right, and also it plays a role in immune function, which is very helpful. 
All right, so here's a picture of our melanocyte producing the melanin and then sticking it into the melanosomes and sharing it with its neighboring cells. All right, the last um, type of um, variations for the skin that I want to talk about are skin markings. And so here's a couple different types of skin markings that I've talked about. We've got our nevus, or what we call a mole, which is a benign growth of tissue, which will usually be darker tinted. But depending on where it's located, if it receives excessive ultraviolet radiation over the course of several many years, that's why in older folks, they go to the dermatologist to have their moles checked, okay? But this nevus is going to be, you know, a, a darker color because of all the melanocytes. And that excessive ultraviolet radiation, we have to keep an eye on it because it could uh, change from a benign tissue to a malignant tissue. And then that's when you have to go and have uh, surgery and have it cut out. Freckles. Right, you will see these yellowish or brown spots scattered throughout, depending. And again, the sun plays a role in the activity of, of uh, these uh, structures of the freckles because the ultraviolet radiation will stimulate those localized areas to produce melanin. Right, so both again, sun exposure or ultraviolet radiation and hereditary or genes, the genetics, will determine if someone has freckles or not. Hemangiomas, there's different types, but basically what you need to know is a hemangioma is a benign blood vessel uh, tumor. And it's gonna be located usually around the head and neck, okay? And so they'll have increased blood flow to that area. And you'll usually hemangiomas will uh, appear uh, bright red if they're um, one of the more benign. And then there's another type called the cavernous hemangioma. And those will have what they call cafe au lait spots, those, those will appear a little bit more brown. Our friction ridges, those are our fingerprints. And this is where the dermal papillae and the epidermal ridges, okay, meet each other. And so that causes these unique, all right, um, indentations and uh, these folds to appear in the surface of your skin. And so we'll use it to fingerprint people. All right, let's get into the dermis here. The second layer to your integument system, the deeper layer is the dermis. Primarily, it is going to be made of connective tissue proper, specifically dense irregular connective tissue. But again, this is the layer that I told you that has all the stuff. So there's two types, the papillary layer, and the reticular layer. All right, so the papillary layer is the more superficial layer. It's primarily going to contain areolar connective tissue, which is a loose connective tissue. And so it's gonna have a decent amount of blood vessels present. But what we'll see in the papillary layer is that the dermis there projects upwards. Okay, and it makes these bumps, and those are called the dermal papillae. And inside those bumps in the dermis, you'll see sensory receptors, you'll see blood vessels in there, okay? Because we gotta get that blood supply as close to the epidermis as possible, because as you know, epithelial tissue is avascular. So the dermal papillae are gonna be those upward projections of the papillary layer. And then our epidermal ridges are these downward projections into the dermis. And so they lock in with one another. And so that allows for a stronger connection between those layers there. So the deeper layer is the reticular layer. And this is that layer that is primarily made up of the dense irregular connective tissue. So here you can kind of see and appreciate, right, the interaction between the epidermal ridges and the dermal 
Hello there. Okay, so in the dermis, you will see, right, because we're dealing primarily with connective tissue proper, right? We have areolar connective tissue, we've got the dense irregular connective tissue in the dermal layers, right? So we're going to also see, as you know, connective tissue has protein fibers in it and ground substance in it. Well, predominantly in the dermis, we'll have collagen and elastic fibers. All right, now the nice thing is these fibers will run in parallel bundles, which is good, okay? Which is really good because that's going to add, both of those protein fibers are going to add, the collagen is going to add resiliency to the tissue. And then the elastic fibers are going to add um, pliability. It makes it nice and flexible. So those two things, and that's why, and we talked about this uh, last, um, last class, right? what happens to the tissues as they age, okay? And as you get older, all right, the cells that produce the collagen and elastic fibers, they become less numerous, so you produce less collagen, less elastic fibers, and so your skin becomes less resilient and less pliable, easier to get damaged. But the nice thing is about these protein fibers is that they help with the resistance to stresses in several different directions. Because dense irregular connective tissue can handle stresses in, 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 in multiple directions, whereas dense regular connective tissue is really good about handling it in one direction. So these collagen elastic fibers, when they're bundled together, laid down in, the, in those parallel bundles there, right? They're going to create, right, these structures called the lines of cleavage. And basically, those are the tension lines that the skin is going to experience. And so if you were to ever get a cut or an incision, right, in the skin, ideally, you want those cuts or incisions to be parallel to the lines of cleavage because that helps with improving the healing time in situations where those injuries are perpendicular to the lines of cleavage, right? That could be an issue. And so that takes longer to heal and most likely there'll be uh, an increase in scar tissue. And we're gonna talk about near the end of this chapter, um, a little bit more about scar tissue. So in some cases, right? You've probably seen maybe somewhere on your body, where you have stretch marks. And in this case, what we're seeing is when we're dealing with those collagen and elastic fibers, those bundles there, right? When you get stretch marks, it's because you overcome, all right, the tensibility of the collagen fibers. So they'll tear and it'll result in stretch marks. All right, finally, the subcutaneous layer our subcutaneous layer, also known as the hypodermis. Okay, again, not part of the integument, made up of loose connective tissue, areolar and adipose. Right? And it has all of the roles of adipose tissue for function. Energy storage, cushioning, which is gonna offer protection and insulation. And because it's loose connective tissue, it's going to be highly vascularized. So we love to give injections into that area there. Especially if we need, um, when we need the rapid onset of whatever the drug is, inject it either into the muscle or into the um, subcutaneous layer because of the amount of blood vessels that are present in those areas there. Okay, we talked about nails. So I, um, I'm gonna quickly review the nails here real, real fast, okay? I'll even, I'm not even gonna go over the words here. We're just gonna look at the pictures. Okay, so when we're looking at our nail, okay, the nail plate is made up of three structures. The nail root, which is underneath the skin, okay? 
Then you're going to have your nail body, which is the exposed part of the nail. And then finally, that white tip there is the free edge. All right, all three of those make up the nail plate. To review, the nail is a modified version of the stratum corneum. So it's basically a modified version of the outer um, uh, strata of the epidermis there. Right? And it sits on a bed here, the nail bed, and this tissue here is living epithelial tissue. Okay, it has been keratinized, it's living. And so when you're looking at your nail body there, you'll notice that it should have a pinkish type of coloration underneath the nail plate. <clears throat> and that's because of the capillaries that are present. The lanula here, right, that appears white. It's a crescent-shaped structure. And that is white because it's just thickened so much that we can't see the capillaries underneath. Our cuticle, which is this little thin uh, tissue line here, all right, that's also known as the epiconium. That's where the skin comes down onto the nail itself. Um, the nail matrix is going to be at the proximal portion of the nail. And that's where we're going to see the active growth of the tissue. So as this uh, tissue is growing, it's going to push the nail distally out towards your fingertip there. And then the area here where your free uh, edge here hangs over the distal tip of your skin, you've got a little bit of thickened stratum corneum right here up in the corner, and that's called the hypoconium. Um, so again, pretty much know what the, the uh, functions of the nails are to protect the distal uh, tips of your fingers and toes. And again, on your fingers, they'll help you with grasping things. I haven't quite mastered grasping things with my toenails yet. All right. So some nail disorders, and some of you might know some of this, all right? You'd be surprised, okay? And especially as you get older, right? You will see, especially when we're dealing with um, this guy right here, the oncomycosis, fungal infections, it's just, it's more prone in older people. And if anyone's ever had to deal with a, a, a toenail infection, uh, it takes a long time. And I can't remember the drug that they prescribe. Um, it's an oral drug. You can also get drugs that you can actually place on the nail directly, but it's like six months that you have to take this stuff. All right. So, a lot of healthcare professionals love to use uh, nail appearance as a way to help them understand the overall health of an individual. Believe it or not, it's a great way. I told you the capillary refill test. I think it was this section, right? If you want to see, all right, just kind of get a quick idea of how well somebody's circulatory system is, is operating. You just pinch their nail, not hard to hurt them. You press down on it for like five, 10 seconds, release it. And initially, when you release it, it'll appear white, and then it'll start to turn uh, back to its pinkish color, okay? If it takes over 10 seconds to return to its pinkish color, then you should start suspecting something. But it should almost immediately refill and turn pink once you move, once you relieve the pressure there. All right, brittle nails, seen this all the time. Right, in which and I, I'm not sure if it was in this class or in another class where somebody asked me about their nails, uh, not theirs specifically, quote unquote, asking for a friend type of thing. Um, but they said that they were, there was a separation in between some of the layers of the nail plate. And that can happen. Right? A lot of time that's going to be a result of malnourishment or malnutrition. Right, and you can actually get the nail to just split right up through the middle there. If anybody has never experienced ingrown toenails, God bless you, right? Because ingrown toenails suck. But basically what happens is the free edge of the nail will start to grow into the lateral portions of the nail, uh, of, the, of the skin of the, uh, of the, usually the toe, okay? And so in some cases, if the intervention occurs early enough, you can stop it. 
In some cases, if it's not uh, treated well enough or taken care of, then sometimes you have to go in and see a specialist like a podiatrist. All right, yellow nail syndrome. All right, this is what happens to the nails, all right, when we see both a decrease in growth and the thickening of the nails. Now, again, that's another malnourishment, malnutrition situation. Um, but we'll see a, 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 this yellowish uh, coloration there, and it's just slowing things down. All right, spoon nails are interesting because the nail itself will appear concave. Normally, the nail should be somewhat flat, but this nail, all right, will have, I can't draw a really good picture. There's your fingertip, all right? And so the nail will have, it'll, it'll almost come off to the top and it'll have like this rounded like appearance to it. That's not a bad picture. I mean, that's all pretty bad, sorry. Okay, um, and in some cases, depending, um, that could be an issue with the heart, all right? Bose lines, uh, you'll see these little, uh, kind of like these white lines in the uh, nail itself. And that's just for a short period of time, okay? You'll have uh, a, a, a delay or a, a brief stoppage of the nail growth, all right? So again, a lot of these nail disorders are something that's going to be, you know, somewhat common, but not all the time. All right, hair, this should be review here real quick. Three parts to our hair, not hair follicle, excuse me, to the pelis or the hair itself. Okay, so when we're talking about hair, we're going to be discussing the actual hair itself, the follicle, and some of the structures that are going to attach to the follicle. So the three zones to the hair, right, hair bulb, root, and the shaft, real easy. The shaft is everything that is above or beyond the surface of the skin. The root is everything below the surface of the skin. And at the very end of the root, we have the hair ball. It's a nice swelling, okay? We'll see it down there in the dermis. And the bulb is going to surround this structure called the hair papilla. And you guys already know what that is. That's all these little blood vessels, okay, that sit down there at the bulb. And so here the hair comes off of that. So this is the only area in which you see living epithelial cells. The shaft, dead. That's, some of you may have gotten that question on your lab exam, okay? And so it probably would have marked you wrong because the answer key is messed up and it says living, but I'm telling you this right now, if, you, if it asked you living or dead and you marked non-living, you nailed it, you got it. <clears throat> okay, hair components. Hair components. So now we talked about the zones of the hair. Now let's talk about the different layers of the hair. You have the hair matrix, the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. Yeah, it's fine because even and I'll even if you got it wrong, I corrected it. Okay, because the um, the exam. Um, the exam, the, the, the review exam was wrong. And I don't know why we, it's not been changed. So if you had that on your exam, there's no way that you're getting it wrong. Trust me. All right, hair components, the matrix. This is where we see cellular division occurring. Okay, so the new cells are going to push superficially up towards the surface of the skin, right? We see it right at the base of the bulb, and keep in mind, we saw the nail matrix, that's the area of the nail that was actively growing, the hair matrix is the area where we see active division of cells for the growth of the hair. Now, when we talk about the thickness of the hair, all right, at the very center of the hair is the medulla. All right, that is going to be made up of soft keratin, so it'll be flexible. The cortex surrounds the medulla, and so that's going to be harder, right, and the cells that are found in that area are going to look squamous-like or flattened. 
And then we have one single cell layer that surrounds the cortex and we call that the cuticle. So I'll show you those real quick. There you go, okay? So the center is the medulla, all right? That tan portion that surrounds the medulla, that is the cortex. And then we have the one thin layer, which is the cuticle. And so that's what we see when we're looking at each other, right? So when you're seeing people's hair, you're looking at the cuticle. And then what surrounds our hair, okay, is the follicle. That's your pant leg. Your leg is the hair, the pants are going to be the follicle. And it surrounds the hair root. And so in some cases, we'll see it in the dermis and even sometimes down in the subcutaneous layer. So our hair follicle, all right, has an outer covering, which is gonna be made up of connective tissue. And then the inner layer of it is gonna be made up of epithelial tissue. So this is an important thing. And again, if you were going to take an embryology course and learn about the development of the baby, okay, and, and, you have, and you will learn about where certain tissues come from, okay, this is one of those situations in which we'll see a structure, right, and parts of the structure came from two different types of tissues, all right? So the outer layer, all right, it came from, the, the connective tissue came from the dermis. The inner layer came from the epidermis. And then we got a muscle that attaches onto the hair follicle. That's made of smooth muscle, which means we don't control it, it's involuntary. And it's this muscle when it contracts, it gives you goosebumps. It pulls on the hair and it causes the hair to elevate. And we'll see that when we're trying to retain heat or in a situation where you have a, a sympathetic nervous system reaction to something. It could be excitement, fight or flight, that kind of thing. All right, some of the functions of hair, protection, facial expression, heat retention, sensory reception, visual identification, chemical signal dispersal. I've discussed all that, okay? Keep in mind, all right, protection, for example, ultraviolet radiation, all right? The hair protects your head. Facial expression, again, if someone uh, is confused, the may elevate an eyebrow, and the hair helps to uh, uh, read those expressions. Okay, heat retention, just talking about goosebumps, right? The goosebumps help to elevate the hair, helps to trap heat against the skin, keep you warm. Also, hair on the top of your head keeps your hair warm, especially in the wintertime. All right, sensory reception, right? Wind blows, moves your hair, moves the hair on your arms, you can tell you get that, that touch sensation, you're in tune and you know what's going on in the external environment. Visual identification, okay? You can tell the age of somebody by looking at the color of their hair, right? Young people tend not to have gray or white hair unless there's some other issue going on, all right? And then our chemical signal dispersal for pheromone, all right? Again, certain glands start to become active in puberty. They uh, release their secretions onto the hair, and then it gets dispersed into the air. Okay, cool. Almost done. I'm just going to finish up with hair, and then we'll be done for the day. All right, so hair loss. It's a natural thing. It happens to everybody. And when I say hair loss, I'm not talking about like when you go bald or anything like that. I'm just talking about hair will fall out of your body, okay? On average, about 10 to 100 a day. Okay. And in some cases, if you lived in my house, you would think it's more because I feel like all the ladies in my house are shedding. All right. But when you get the actual thinning of hair, all right. And like I said that before, the aging effect on certain tissues, hair will thin. Or we call that alopecia. That's normal as we get older. Hair follicles just produce thinner hairs. All right. And in some cases, all right, we'll see diffuse hair loss, right? Well, you'll see it from parts of the scalp. Now, you will see this, and I've seen this before in patients, okay? And many of them are women, right? Where they'll have a considerable amount of hair, right? That is no longer, well, that they've lost from their scalp. And so their scalp will appear to be the, the, the consistency of the hair there, 
it'll just seem to have thinned out. Now this happens quite a bit in, 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 in some women. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and Christina, you'll see one of those reasons for that is hormones, okay? You're getting a change in hormones. Yep, yeah. And so, and you'll even see that in uh, postmenopausal uh, women. But believe it or not, certain drugs, that's a big one. If it's a young person that has not been pregnant, all right, and they're getting diffuse hair loss, it's either going to be some sort of drug that they're on. I'm not saying illegal drugs, but it's either going to be a result of the drugs or there's going to be some sort of deficiency going on in their diet. Iron deficiency um, is going, it can be one of the causes for diffuse hair loss. All right, we're all familiar with male, male pattern baldness. All right, the crown um, is the top portion of the scalp there. So you'll see uh, those folks will lose their hair first on that area. Again, hormones play a big role in that. And of course, genetics, unfortunately. Um, Hertuism is interesting. Male pattern uh, hairiness, uh, that will occur in women. And especially it can happen in women that get um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And uh, for whatever reason, again, when you see hertuism in, 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 in women, I knew a, a young lady a long time ago when I was in my 20s, when I was living in Long Island, who had hertuism. And to help deal with that, all right, she took birth control. And it helped to regulate her hormones and it helped to regulate her hertuism because the hertuism, she was dealing with excessive androgen production. And that's what can happen with folks that have hertuism. Androgens are going to be those male uh, sex hormones. All right, let's stop here, okay? Take a few minutes uh, break early. Let's stop here. And what we'll do 